Hey everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to this opening session of the Bretton Woods Committee's 2021 International Council Conference. We have an exciting week of sessions planned and we look forward to all of you participating and engaging in what we hope will be a productive week of dialogues. Um, this year's International Council will focus on shared multilateral solutions to the ongoing global economic challenges in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, we'll have wide ranging discussions throughout the week discussing everything from vaccine access to debt buildup, energy prices, climate change, and to today's topics of digital currencies. We're very fortunate to have a very esteemed panel of guests with us today, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing their views on how to create common standards around digital currencies. So just before I turn it over to them, a few quick housekeeping notes for me. We will reserve some time for audience questions uh, after the panel discussion. If you have a question, we ask that you please submit it by typing it into the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. We will collect these throughout the conversation, and then we will call on individuals during the Q&A portion, and you may pose your questions directly to the speakers. So if you do submit a question, we ask that you please remain on standby and are prepared to unmute your microphone. Um, uh, let me now quickly introduce our speakers. Um, we have with us Ms. Caitlin Long, who is Chairman and CEO of Avanti. She is a 22-year Wall Street veteran who has been active in Bitcoin since 2012 and has deep experience in both traditional financial services as well as digital assets. Um, we're also fortunate to be joined by Eric Rosengren, who recently retired from his role as the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, where he spent a 35-year career at the bank. Um, and during his tenure, he led a multitude of initiatives, um, but importantly, work on exploring a potential central bank digital currency. We also are joined by Hoon Song Shin, who is economic advisor and head of research at the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, Mr. Shin co-leads the Monetary and Economic Department and is part of the bank's senior management as a member of the executive committee. We also have with us Tamika Tillman, who is global head of policy at Andreessen Horowitz Crypto. He previously served as senior advisor to now President Joe Biden, as well as the two secretaries of state, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. And he's held uh, numerous other advisory roles as a leader in technology and innovation. And I will introduce our moderators. We have Afsane Beshlas, who is CEO of Rock Creek Group, um, and previously was a partner at Car Carlisle Group and also treasurer and CIO at the World Bank. And she is on BWC's board of directors and will be co-chairing BWC's new Future of Finance Working Group alongside Bill Dudley. Uh, and Bill Dudley is BWC's chairman of our board of directors and executive committee, and most of you know him as the former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, I will now turn it over to Bill to tell us a little bit more about the future of finance working group, and then he and Afsane will lead our discussion today. So Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, today is the kickoff of the future of finance working group. Uh, we thought this was an important uh, initiative of the Bretton Woods Committee because there's a lot of important topics in finance that cut across uh, uh, national boundaries uh, and where international co cooperation and coordination could be helpful in leading to better, uh, better outcomes. So when we considered uh, the, the, this working group, we asked ourselves the question, what, what topics should we work on? And we essentially set three criteria. One, the topic, it must be one that cuts across jurisdictions. So it's not just about national sovereigns, it's about something that actually has international coordination aspects to it. We, we thought that it had to be an issue that would benefit from international coordination and cooperation and, and global financial standards. Uh, and we also thought it had to be important to, for the well-functioning global financial system. So what we've come up to with is two topics to start with for the Future of Finance Working Group. Uh, one today's digital currencies uh, for a global economy. I think it's going to be hugely important as we go forward. We're at a very you know, key uh, point in the, in the process where we have a pretty big uh, digital currency uh, uh, system in place, but it's really operating outside of the regulated uh, system. And so there really are some interesting issues there that we're going to explore today. And the second one is climate change, where we think that the focus of the Bretton Woods Committee should really be about the financial stability risks uh, associated with climate change. And we're going to work on that uh, as well. Future Finance Working Group is open to all uh, Bretton Woods Committee members. Uh, we're in the process of building out that membership. So if you're interested in, in joining the finance, Future Finance Working Group, please let us know because we'd like to have uh, a big group, uh, a diverse group uh, with different backgrounds, different from different geographies. So we can really 
uh, tackle this issue, not on a US centric basis, but on a global basis going, going, going forward. So today we're starting with digital currencies and as Emily has, has, has outlined, we have a really great uh, panel to take this on, we're offering a lot of different perspectives you know, from the official sector, but also from uh, the private sector, uh, from the investment side. And so I think we're gonna you know, look at this issue from a, a lot of different uh, perspectives. You know, as I see it, this is a, a good time to, to take this on because digital currencies are already very pervasive. Uh, you know, we have about one and a half trillion dollars of cryptocurrencies and stable coins outstanding, but it's operating mostly outside of the regulated uh, financial system and it's global in nature. So on one hand, there's great promise in terms of what's happening because you can imagine that this system of decentralized finance can lead to, you know, much cheaper cross-border payments, can be much more efficient, can be much more inclusive than the regime that we have in place. But on the other hand, there's quite a bit of risk. Uh, for example, stable coins, uh, which are tied to fiat and currencies, it's not clear how well those, those stable coins are regulated or backstop. So I think from my perspective, we do need to have global standards. We do need to bring this whole ecosystem within the regulated financial system, but we really have to do it in a way that you know, we don't lose the benefits of the innovation that's taking place, which I think is really uh, quite, uh, quite impressive. As Emily said, we have four great participants today, Eric Rosengren, Lynchen, uh, Caitlin Long, and Tamiko Tillerman. So we're gonna start with a short remarks from each, and then we'll have moderated discussion led by Asani, Abeith Shoss, and myself, uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for questions. So without further ado, let's uh, start with uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, it's a great topic and uh, I'm looking forward both to the, my brief comments, but also uh, to doing the Q&A. Uh, since the comment opening comments are pretty brief, I'm gonna make three main points. The first one is that I do expect over time that the digital currency technology is unlikely to be a major roadblock. So the Boston Fed uh, is currently doing a joint effort with MIT uh, focused, uh, MIT has a digital currency initiative, and I would say they're making very good progress. So they're coming out with a working paper relatively soon that'll provide a lot more details, and I'm not going to steal any of their thunder. But at, at a very high level, the core payments and settlements engine meets the likely needs for throughput and transaction speed. So that's very good news that I think the technology for the core processing is there. Now, that is not to say that that is a fully developed uh, digital currency. There's still significant work that needs to be done on privacy, on resilience, and on security. And as those various issues are tackled, it's likely to slow both the throughput and possibly the transaction speed. And obviously, we haven't had the policy discussion in Washington yet. And depending on what bells and whistles get added, uh, from that policy discussion, that could also slow down some of the throughput. But I'm pretty confident with time and money that I think these issues can be overcome. The second point I would make is that I think the major issue for a digital currency, at least in the United States, is much more likely to be on the policy front. So ideally, there would be agreement on appropriate design features between Congress, the administration, and the Fed. But to get all three to agree in an environment where both regulated and unregulated entities are going to have very strong interests in exactly how the structure develops, I think that's going to pose a political challenge to try to get an agreement. So I think it's really important that we move the technology along. So whenever that policy discussion uh, is done, that we have the capability to launch. But until the policy discussion has been fully developed, I think it's going to be uh, very difficult to predict uh, when or if uh, digital currency will come to the United States. Uh, the third is, uh, and certainly all the panelists know this, but for people that don't spend as much time, I would say that there are very big differences between Bitcoin, uh, stablecoin, and digital currency. And uh, I would highlight particularly for the purpose of a digital currency, when you think about Bitcoin, it's a, a relatively slow technology. The asset price is highly volatile. 
And so I don't think it's a particularly good solution for retail payments. It's more of an alternative asset class than it is kind of a, a potential uh, retail payments mechanism. For stablecoin, as Bill's comments highlighted, uh, currently unregulated, I would concur with Bill's assessment that that probably shouldn't uh, continue, uh, that I do have concerns about the unregulated nature. Uh, that's particularly true depending on which stablecoin you talk about, uh, what assets they hold backing the so-called stablecoin vary across uh, stablecoins. Some of them look like very risky prime money market funds. Others are much closer to a government money market fund. Um, so I do think that there is certainly a role to think about the last, uh, the pandemic and the financial crisis, we had runs on money market funds, uh, primarily the prime money market funds, and they required the Boston Fed to run facilities to in effect bail out uh, the money market fund industry. So we don't wanna be in a position where we have to do the same thing for stable coins. Now, just as money market funds serve as kind of a transactions account for brokerage accounts, so if you have a Fidelity or a Schwab account, you sell stocks, it tends to go into a money market fund. You can choose whether it's a prime or a government money market fund, but it basically is a transactions account for trading. It has a lot of attributes that are similar to what bank deposits are, but for most people, they're using it for different purposes. I think the same thing's true for stable coins. Uh, that they're much more likely to continue to be a, a transaction account for people that are trading in and out of various uh, cryptocurrencies. And I think that role is going to continue. Stable coins are designed to run on a particular blockchain. They're subject to the rules of the blockchain. And it's a completely different uh, payment and settlement mechanism than a digital currency run by the central bank. Um, for the digital currency, at least in the United States, I think it's less likely that we're gonna be designing um, a digital currency for the blockchain uh, or for a particular blockchain. Uh, currently, the uh, work that the Boston Fed and MIT are doing are not actually operating on a blockchain in part because we wanna have sufficient throughput and speed of transactions that the distributed ledger is not as effective a mechanism for uh, meeting kind of the operational needs that we think we would need. Um, I think it's very unlikely that the digital currency would be the base transaction account for cryptocurrency trading. I think that's going to continue to be a, a role for stablecoin. Um, and I would view uh, digital currency much more as a retail payment. So it really is a substitute for cash. You can't pay for something on the internet with cash. You just can't do the delivery mechanism. So uh, the digital currency is providing you a mechanism to in effect use cash, but in its digital form. It's gonna be safe, it's gonna be resilient. It's a payment mechanism with the finality of cash. So uh, the settlement, you know, when you pay for a, a good with cash, uh, you make the transfer and the transfer is done. You don't worry about anything else. Uh, digital currency ideally would work the same way. So uh, just to sum up, I expect that all three, the Bitcoin, the stable coin, and the digital currency over time are likely to coexist. I think they're gonna serve different purposes. And I don't think a digital currency by itself will cause, for example, stable coins to disappear. I think there'll be market segmentation about what roles each of these uh, play. The digital currency, I think, is important because it provides a low risk payments mechanism. So there is risk in stablecoin. There's certainly risk in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And I think we want the base digital payment system to be one that is much more resilient, much safer, um, so that we don't have some of the challenges that have occurred in uh, the crypto space. Uh, I think the commercial applications more than likely are going to be built on top of the digital currency. Um, I do view this more as an infrastructure that the central bank's providing. We provide a lot of infrastructure already to the payment system, uh, but most of the other things are added on by various financial intermediaries. So I'll just stop there and uh, leave any additional comments for the Q&A. Thank you, Eric. Let's turn now to uh, Lin Song Shin. Lin? Thanks, Bill. Uh, it's great to join you on this panel and uh, just check the, the attendee list and it's uh, great to see um, so many old friends uh, there. So thanks for joining us on this um, uh, 
uh, on this panel. Uh, my remarks are going to be very much dovetailing with what Eric has just uh, laid out. And so let me say a couple of words about central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. And um, I think the important uh, theme um, that we probably underestimate is the continuity here, because the, the current two tier system um, has served us well, but is, uh, but is uh, you know, evolving. And um, uh, the most recent uh, developments in retail fast payment systems, I think, uh, you know, highlight some of the, uh, some, of the uh, some of the design features that we would also see in a CBDC as well. Uh, we, we know uh, very much about the UPI system in India, uh, but the PIX um, system in Brazil, which was just launched, uh, you know, less than a year ago, um, has really, I think, uh, uh, you know, captured the imagination um, uh, in a number of respects. I mean, it's, it's signed up two thirds of the population already in, in, less, than, in less than a year. Um, it's a retail fast payment system in that um, it is a two tier system, uh, but it's powered by the same kind of um, data and uh, permission infrastructure as you would see in a, in a retail CBDC. I think what, uh, these examples show, um, and in the case of Brazil, uh, you know, one number which, which really caught my attention was that 40 million people had, uh, for the first time, made a digital payment using, using PIX when they have uh, not, you know, not made a payment before. So it gives you a sense that uh, central banks are certainly innovating, that they're really making a big impact. And um, it's not just talk, actually. Um, uh, you know, much of the innovation is actually being, being seen in terms of tangible results. So what I would say is that, um, you know, when we think about CBDCs, uh, central banks and the BIS as a, as a kind of, um, you know, um, umbrella for the central bank community as a whole, um, we're envisaging a kind of triple imperative here, triple imperative in the, in the policy um, approach. And this triple imperative arises from the centrality data uh, in, the, in the digital economy. Um, because, of, because data and the network effects mean that payment systems are prone to concentration uh, and the emergence of closed networks, you know, walled gardens, if you like. So competition and openness um, uh, are really key policy objectives. And the key concept here is the so-called interoperability, whereby um, you know, one platform can uh, link uh, seamlessly with other platforms. And this will aid competition and openness. And to make it really, um, uh, to make it really effective, what you need is the data infrastructure. So it's data ownership and the consent mechanisms uh, whereby the users can grant consent. And this is going to be um, the most effective way of uh, maintaining competition. And here we have really cool um, technologies which are you know, decades old, like, uh, uh, you know, like public key cryptography that powers these APIs uh, in, uh, you know, in these retail fast payment systems that has a great deal of you know, proven um, worth in terms of maintaining confidenti uh, the confidentiality of personal data as well. The second part of this triple imperative is the importance of maintaining the integrity of the system. Um, and we want to maintain the, the, the integrity of the payment system as a public good. And among other things, what that means is we want to guard against money laundering, ransomware attacks, and other illicit activities. This means that we need to have the wherewithal to do the KYC uh, you know, and the AML. So this means that we need the data infrastructure based probably most, uh, you know, almost certainly on, on some form of digital ID. But this gives rise to the third, uh, you know, imperative, which is about privacy, because, you know, data privacy is not only an important uh, instrumental goal, it's actually, you know, it takes on the attributes of a basic right as well. So, uh, so this triple imperative, so, you know, competition, the integrity of the system and privacy. Uh, you know, we feel that this triple imperative is best met if we, uh, you know, if we have a retail CBDC within a two-tier system. So it's not uh, where you have, uh, if you like, uh, uh, everyone having an account at the central bank and you're, you know, uh, marginalizing the commercial banking sector. Uh, it's much more that uh, you're working within the two-tier system and uh, you're taking advantage of the best uh, uh, you know, division of labor whereby the, the private sector is taking on uh, the task that uh, it does best, which is to serve customers better. Now, um, 
one crucial question, maybe we can get to this later, is if you have something like PIX in Brazil, a uh, very well working retail fast payment system, hopefully in, in the US as well with FedNow uh, coming on screen uh, in, a, in a few years time, uh, you know, there'll be a you know, very well working retail fast payment system in the US as well. Um, the question is what, what additional do you get? What extra mileage do you get? Uh, by going the extra step of actually issuing a CBDC uh, rather than having a retail plus payment system. And I think here that I would, I would put uh, two things down here. One is something which is um, very tangible, which is uh, the, if you like, a more parsimonious monetary architecture, especially for cross-border payments, where you can really um, distill uh, the very complicated multi-layered um, correspondent banking type of transactions to something which is much simpler, where you have uh, a common infrastructure that links CBDCs. Um, and with, uh, uh, at, at the BIS, we're doing a, a, a lot of experimentation on this, and we can get back to this later. This, the second component, I think, is, is less tangible, but I think it's very, very important um, in that, you know, it's, um, um, it's, it's somewhat symbolic, but it's also a uh, sort of foundational feature. What a, CBC, uh, what a CBDC does is to establish a tangible link between the central bank and the population at large. It's a kind of social contract in the trust, uh, you know, in the money as a public good. So um, when you have a claim on the central bank, it's like having cash, you know, as, as Eric was saying, uh, but just in digital form. And that gives rise to, I think, a much closer, if you like, um, political economy foundations for the monetary system as well. Um, as well. So let me let me finish there, Bill, and uh, we can come back to some of the things later. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn now to uh, Caitlin Long. Caitlin. Thank you, Bill, and good morning to all. As someone with substantial practical experience in both the traditional banking and digital asset worlds, and someone who applied, who has a bank charter uh, and applied for payment system access at the Federal Reserve a year ago, uh, including with a business model to issue a stable coin-like instrument as a bank deposit, I'd like to focus on three things that in my view really matter when it comes to the intersection of traditional and digital asset markets. Settlement risk first, interoperability second, and then legal clarity. Regarding settlement risk, the reality is that the vast majority of fiat to crypto exchange transactions occur with the US dollar as the fiat leg of the transaction but there are huge differences in both the timing and finality of settlement between the US dollar and crypto. Therein lies substantial risk. And the firms that intermediate between the two, including central banks, must manage such risks very carefully. Specifically, while Bitcoin and Ether transactions settle in minutes with irreversibility, ACH transaction settlement is measured in days. And settlement finality can take up to two years now as consumers can reverse transactions for fraud up to two years after the transaction date. So it's not difficult to see how such huge differences in settlement speed and finality can create real world problems. Indeed, these settlement differences gave rise to stable coins in the first place as traders needed a US dollar payment mechanism that allowed them to move dollars around the world in minutes with finality. The proposed Basel III capital requirements for crypto are heavily focused on price volatility, but are woefully insufficient in my opinion in reflecting this settlement risk and are therefore too low, not too high as most, most, most bankers argue. Indeed, Basel III generally doesn't prescribe much capital requirement for settlement risk. Why? Because traditional financial markets have clearing houses that smooth over temporary settlement failures. Examples of clearing houses include central banks and other central counterparties that provide clearing and or settlement services for everything from money to securities to commodities to derivatives. But here's the problem. While the vast majority of traditional financial assets are centrally cleared and settled, including dollars at central banks, in the US securities at the DTC, and even gold at bullion banks and the LBMA, only about 8% of Bitcoins are held by centralized intermediaries right now, according to Glassnode. But in crypto, such centralized intermediaries control only a small minority of the assets. This means it's not possible to replicate the central clearing model of traditional finance for Bitcoin 
and other decentralized cryptocurrencies because individuals own the vast majority of them and most of them rarely trade. So looking at this from a historical lens, what's old has become new again. Just as JP Morgan, the man himself, became the lender of last resort during the panic of 1907, the so-called crypto whales, the large individual owners of crypto assets, have already been filling that same role as lender of last resort during crypto market panics because there are no such central clearinghouses to fill that role and likely never will be. Second, let's move to interoperability. Here again, historical analogies apply. I'll divide this topic into two subsections, one from the economist's point of view and the other from the technologist's point of view. One of the most relevant papers to interoperability is actually from 1999. It's the famous Lacker, Walker, and Weinberg paper called The Fed's Entry into Check Clearing Reconsidered. Hat tip to Dr. Manwan Singh, my longtime sparring partner at the IMF, who pointed me to this. The paper traces the history of private check clearing networks in the US before the founding of the Federal Reserve in 1913, be before which private correspondent banks created and integrated regional check clearing networks. But these private networks were not national and they all charged fees for their services, which meant that none of them were able to clear checks at par, i.e. they cleared checks at par minus their transaction fees. It wasn't until the Fed itself later started guaranteeing the payment of checks at par in 1916, thereby creating a structural advantage relative to the private networks, while also mutualizing the costs of running check clearing infrastructure across its member banks, that the nationwide network effects for check clearing truly took hold and checks became a dominant payment method across the United States for decades. This analogy holds true in the crypto context today, especially with regard to stable coins. Crypto exchanges are serving the role of correspondent banks. They can either be centralized exchanges such as Coinbase or decentralized exchanges that run only on code such as Uniswap. But just as with the private check clearing networks of the pre-1916 era in the United States, someone has to pay the transaction costs. Decentralized exchanges mutualize these costs by setting transaction fees as part of their smart contract so that all users, akin to member banks, know upfront what fees they will pay, which are then deducted from the members' trading, staking, and seniorage revenues, as the case may be. The stablecoin market may evolve in the same way that private check clearing networks did, whereby a central bank guarantees payment at par and mutualizes the transaction costs. But while that may be true for stablecoins, such an evolution is unlikely for a disinflationary asset such as Bitcoin. Next, speaking of interoperability from a technologist's perspective, I'll leave you with a few simple facts. Anyone can join the Bitcoin network, spinning up a node and syncing it with the network within a few hours. For Ethereum, syncing requires only a few days. But for ACH and Fedwire though, integration takes many months to deal with all the intricate details. We heard President Rosengren talk about the bells and whistles that are likely to be added to the CBDC. Those intricate details mean more integration time. A handful of US banks have dealt with this problem by spending three to four years building proprietary middleware to integrate their horse and buggy backend systems into their Ferrari front end ones. I've posited that the most significant change in US banking recently was the Fed's approval of API native core banking software providers over the past couple of years. But today I'll, I'll go a step further. While all the chatter in banking today is about the era of APIs, open blockchain protocols will quickly make even APIs obsolete in banking. If we could peer into the future of banking a decade from now and look back at today, I suspect that the following statement will have proven true. The KISS principle, or keep it simple, stupid, will have won. It used to be that complex proprietary technology systems whose integration requirements were difficult always won the day. That's how the financial services industry builds systems. But to quote the proverbial raven, nevermore, not after Bitcoin shifted the paradigm for the ease of technology into integration into a global payment network, which is measured in hours, not months. Networks whose integration requirements are too onerous relative to the benefits of integration will lose their network effects. Note to CBDC software developers, KISS, keep it simple, stupid, if you want other developers to use your system voluntarily. Finally, a very quick word on legal clarity. 
If a regulated financial institution cannot prove that it has clear legal title to the asset, then owning that asset is an unsafe and unsound practice for that financial institution. I would encourage every jurisdiction globally to quickly clarify the legal status of digital assets so that banks can get clear title to them. And in the US specifically would encourage the swift enactment of the proposed UCC Article 12 to clarify the commercial and property, property law status of digital assets. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Caitlin, let's turn now to Tamika. Thanks very much, Bill. A great pleasure to be with all of you and uh, marvelous to hear the comments of my fellow panelists. Uh, a couple of quick points just to, to move us into the Q&A. Uh, the first is, well, for most people on this call, we at least have the perception that the financial system works relatively well uh, on our behalf. It's important to take a step back and recognize just how broken our status quo has become. If you look around the world, last year we had 100 major data breaches in the United States every single business day. Uh, that is unacceptable. Uh, we had foreign criminal gangs uh, that stole an estimated $80 billion uh, from the CARES Act uh, as a result of deficiencies in our payment systems. $38 billion in federal rent relief was never distributed because, uh, again, our, our systems just aren't up to the task. And even before the pandemic, Treasury, by its own estimates, was making $175 billion of improper government payments each year. So it's critical for all of us to, to recognize that the status quo is not what we should be aspiring to uh, in, in trying to build out better systems for the future. We're also, I think, recognizing, uh, and a number of the panelists spoke to this, that there is increasing intersection between financial technologies and digital currency uh, and the broader internet as a whole. And, and this is the, the second point that I would make. We need to think about the issue of digital currency not simply as a matter of how do we improve our financial sector, but really how do we design the next generation of the internet? How do we bring a third generation of internet technology or Web3 to a place where it will provide more benefits, more equity, more opportunity uh, to a wide array of people. As Han suggested, we believe strongly that this will require a comprehensive approach to digital infrastructure. Uh, this is about more than simply a currency layer. It will require integration with data layers. It will require integration with digital ID. Uh, and then a variety of different services will be built on top of that foundation. You're seeing this uh, story play out in a number of countries around the world with pretty spectacular results, even in places that have only deployed one or two of these layers successfully. Uh, if you look at Kenya, with their digital payment system, they have lifted now 2% of the population out of poverty by virtue of having widespread access uh, to digital payments. Uh, if you look at Bangladesh, uh, they have saved an estimated 2 billion days of time by virtue of having better digital infrastructure systems. If you look at Estonia, perhaps the original poster child uh, for this type of digital infrastructure approach, they recoup 2% of GDP each year as a result of access to these technologies. Those are breathtaking numbers and they're frankly more than any country can afford to ignore in a world of increasing competition. So where does that leave us going forward? Uh, as, as a number of the panelists recognized, and Eric laid this out very clearly, we need a clear regulatory and policy framework for the deployment of these tools. We certainly do not have that today. Uh, there are certain uh, areas uh, where uh, there's work underway, and, and that's encouraging, and I'll speak to one of those in a moment. Uh, but beyond that, we need a national strategy in the United States, and I would argue in every country around the world, when it comes to deploying digital infrastructure. Uh, these have become foundational elements uh, of our competitiveness, our economy, our society, in the same way that roads or water infrastructure were foundational elements uh, of infrastructure in the 20th century. Uh, and we need to take this task extremely seriously. Uh, we see also a critical need for regulatory harmonization. In the US, if you want to work in this space, you are dealing with over a dozen federal regulatory bodies. 
that is neither desirable nor sustainable uh, if we want to maintain our financial edge. Many other countries have dealt with this far more effectively and have more streamlined regulatory frameworks, but it's critical to recognize that we have a long way to go uh, in this space uh, if we want to have a, a clear regulatory framework in, in place. And then beyond that, in specific applications like stable coins, where we are starting to see the emergence of regulatory activity, we recently published a, a piece laying out a suggested regulatory framework for stable coins. We'd suggest three broad overarching principles that policymakers should keep in mind as they approach these issues. Uh, the first is advancing equitable access. Uh, there are still millions and millions of individuals uh, in, in the US and billions around the world that don't have access to the digital economy. Uh, this can be a, a relatively efficient, affordable solution uh, to providing individuals with an on-ramp to take part in these systems. Uh, second, we need to do more to ensure the integrity of stablecoin issuers and reserves. Uh, this was mentioned previously, but there have been an array of different approaches to the issuance of stable coins. Asset-backed stable coins are only useful uh, if the individuals who are buying into those systems have a high degree of confidence uh, in the integrity uh, of the assets that they are purchasing. Uh, we need greater transparency and we need greater accountability uh, in how those systems are, are being designed. And finally, we need to strengthen the technical and operational resilience of stablecoin networks. Stablecoins are going to be essential to ensuring the vitality and vibrancy uh, of this ecosystem going forward. Uh, we feel strongly that they should be able to exist alongside uh, any central bank digital currency solutions that are put in place. Uh, but if we are given, uh, if stable coins are given uh, the space that they need to operate, we believe that they can be a powerful engine, uh, not only for innovation, uh, but also for inclusion uh, going forward. There is a great deal of work to be done in this space. If we get it right, the upside is really quite extraordinary. We will be able to design not only a financial system, uh, but again, an entire digital economy that will have far greater levels of opportunity, far greater levels of security, far greater levels of equity than what we have today. Uh, and this is certainly a, a challenge that uh, deserves the best efforts of uh, all those participating in this conversation and policymakers worldwide. Thank you, Tamika. So I'm going to build on, ask my first question to the panelists that builds a little off on what you just said. Uh, so there's, a lot, there's this potential big opportunity out there. Uh, and the question I have is, are we going to get there? Are, you know, where are we going to be 10 years from now? What does good look like? And what are the impediments to good, to getting to good uh, over, the next de over the next decade? I want you to start with uh, you, Tamika, and then we'll, just go, we'll go backwards. Thank you. I, I think the, the first uh, determinant of where we're going to be in 10 years is whether we can develop a clear vision of where we want to be uh, in 10 years. Uh, and I, I will admit I am shocked at the absence of discussion uh, on this topic. It's, it's starting now. And again, this uh, discussion that we're having today is an important step in the right direction. But we need a clear vision for how we want to use these tools and technologies in open societies. Uh, for the most part, there is not consensus on what that should look like. Uh, tomorrow, Andreessen Horowitz will be releasing a, a comprehensive policy agenda uh, for the future of Web3, the third generation of the internet, uh, that incorporates digital currencies and a variety of related systems. But we think it's critical to, to lay out uh, at the very beginning uh, what the destination should be. Uh, ideally, we're going to be able to design an internet, we're going to be able to design digital financial systems that have uh, far higher levels uh, of inclusion, far higher levels uh, of accountability and security uh, than what we have today. Uh, and, and what we see, if you look out not too many years uh, into the future, uh, is a, a world where every country and every citizen in every country should have access to Estonia-style digital services, uh, Estonia-style digital financial infrastructure, 
Uh, it should be very easy for individuals to use tools like DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, to rapidly spin up companies. Uh, they can become the new LLCs and the new corporations uh, of the 21st century uh, and provide modularity uh, and a lot of simplicity for those that want to take part in the digital economy. Uh, and it should be much easier for anyone anywhere uh, to move value in the same way that we now, thanks to the internet, move information. Uh, one quick example of this uh, before we move along. Uh, I have a friend in Malawi uh, who is a very talented artist, uh, but you know, he lives in a, a mud hut. Uh, chickens come into his living room to sleep every night. Uh, my mother saw some of his art on my wall uh, and wanted some for herself. Uh, and we were able over email to negotiate a great deal. He was happy. My mom was happy. Uh, and then when it came time to send payment, it was going to cost as much to purchase those paintings, to, to move the money, uh, as the paintings themselves. Uh, this is one example of a, a case where you have an individual with immense talent and potential to participate in the global economy who's currently on the sidelines. Those are the problems we should be able to solve if we do this right, uh, and we now have the tools to do that, which we have not had previously. Caitlin, what's your assessment of where we're going to be? And what are the sure. If we look back on, on today, 10 years from now, I, I think what where we will have evolved is that most finance will be running on open public permissionless blockchains and regulated institutions will be issuing fiat currencies as second layer applications of those. In other words, the, the, the technology doesn't necessarily need to be owned by the central institution like a central bank, but, the, the, but bestowing the right to create fiat currencies, in other words, commercial banking money, M1, can be, while still coexisting with these public open permissionless blockchain networks. And specifically, it gets to the ease of integration with technology. That is something that so much of the traditional banking system misses, because they're so used to these very prescribed, very detailed technology systems, which create the need to take months to integrate with them. The paradigm shifted. And that paradigm shift is that it, it can take only hours to integrate with these new public permissionless blockchains. And the question then becomes, what is the role for the regulated sector, given that those we now have protocols to transfer value both in large scale and in small scale globally within minutes with irreversibility and much lower cost than those existing networks. Now, I'm voting with my feet and setting up an API-based banking system for US dollars. Uh, so I do not think that these uh, open uh, permissionless networks will make fiat currencies obsolete. But we are, as we were talking in the, in the green room before this, this panel, we are at, an, at a critical inflection point where one of the great ironies, and I've got to give a hat tip to Nick Carter, is that to the extent that, that policymakers get the integration with these systems right, they actually prolong the power of fiat currencies. So Nick Carter in particular pointed out the vast majority of stable coins in a truly free and unregulated market went for a US dollar linked instrument. 99% of stable coin vo volume outstanding is US dollar linked. And what does that mean? It means they wanted a much faster, better, cheaper, more transparent way of moving US dollars than was available uh, using traditional systems. And it started with crypto traders needing to arbitrage, wanting to arbitrage huge spreads in the Bitcoin price across different exchanges in the world. You cannot take advantage of that if you're waiting for ACH or Fedwire or even SWIFT. Um, and, and so they created this whole new payment mechanism, which, which I truly hope uh, that, that traditional finance embraces. It is better, faster, and cheaper. Uh, and, but I do recognize that it is a different paradigm than the traditional paradigm where, where the, the technology is prescribed. And, uh, and, and instead, what we should think about is that the regulated institutions 
that can issue commercial bank money should choose the technology platforms upon which they issue it as a second layer. So for example, issuing a, issuing a, 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 a US dollar as a layer two Bitcoin instrument using either the liquid network or potentially even the lightning network. It, it, right now, the, the, the central banks don't prescribe the databases that commercial banks use to issue their dollars. They, the central banks don't care whether it's a Microsoft MySQL database or an Oracle database. Why should the, should the central banks care whether those fiat currencies of the future are issued on as a second layer on Bitcoin, a second layer on Ethereum, or on Carta or on Hyperledger. It shouldn't matter as long as the security standards are up to par. And th those that are licensed to issue that, that second layer money, the, the, the M1 in the commercial banking system uh, should have the freedom and flexibility to choose the technology standards. And that is where I think we will go because the integration, the ease of integration is what makes those systems so interoperable. And it's so easy to build network effects on easy to integrate global networks that already exist. So Hun and uh, Erica, what, what, what's your view? It sounds like there's a lot of work for the policymakers to do to make this uh, a reality. Yes, absolutely, Bill. Your question is a really good one. You know, 10 years is a flash, is a flash in the eye for, uh, for some questions, but uh, if we look back 10 years, just, um, just look at what, uh, what we've uh, you know, witnessed in the last 10 years. Uh, 10 years. 10 years ago, I would have, um, you know, I, I think not many people would have uh, you know, heard of Alipay and WeChat Pay. Uh, they now have a 94% you know, market share in mobile payments in China. Uh, I think this goes to this idea that, um, earlier that I mentioned, which is the, um, the idea that uh, the data on the net, uh, and the network effects in payments um, means that these networks are very prone to concentration um, and the emergence of closed networks. And I think um, uh, this does raise the question of how do we approach um, the policy towards, uh, uh, towards you know, big tech players coming into, coming into finance as well. When we connect that to the debate on stable coins, it gets um, uh, uh, you know, even more uh, challenging in, in one respect. Um, you know, Eric uh, mentioned uh, stable coins as being akin to prime money market funds. But if the, if the stable coin is also issued by a big tech, what it means is that you have an environment, you have an ecosystem, um, which also has its own currency to some extent. Um, so you have currency, which is uh, uh, partly um, uh, they're connecting all the services within, within this ecosystem. And um, if that becomes a very large player and you know, looking at uh, China, uh, that certainly is not uh, you know, out of the question. Um, we do uh, then face the issue of, you know, what does this mean for the monetary system itself? Uh, can we actually um, see this as a way of, um, you know, fragmenting the monetary system? Uh, we think of money as being issued by the central bank. Um, what if we have a fragmentation of the monetary system where part of the monetary, uh, part of the monetary system is outside the scope of the central bank's um, you know, control? And that does raise very, uh, you know, important policy questions. So, so, and so, what I would say is, um, and I fully agree with Caitlin on this, many of these issues are not uh, about technology. Uh, the most difficult questions are about policy. And uh, in, uh, you mentioned earlier, Bill, about the importance of having a global perspective on this. When we think about the cross-border uh, uh, interconnections here, um, I think the, the integrity point, I think, uh, remains still a very important point. You know, we do need safeguards to make sure that we guard against money laundering and ransomware attacks. Uh, and so KYC AML based on some kind of digital ID is gonna be essential. Now the question is how do we um, envisage this linking up of uh, um, you know, these uh, monetary systems across borders? I think the idea of some supranational organization having access to you know, your citizens digital ID, I mean, that's very fraught. Uh, you know, we're not gonna get there. Um, I think much more promising would be um, a monetary cooperation, some kind of you know, mutual recognition of digital ID. You know, there are very you know, clever uh, tools you know, using zero knowledge proofs and so on that, 
verify digital ID without actually having access to the ID itself. Uh, but and so what this means is that central bank cooperation actually is, is going to be you know, more important than ever. And, uh, um, and this is why, for example, the G20 um, is, is pushing the, uh, you know, the roadmap uh, on, on uh, cross-border payments. So um, I would finish on that point, Bill, that um, the biggest challenges are more about policy uh, rather than the technology. Uh, you're on mute, Bill. I take that to you, Eric. Is, is the Fed going to keep up? <laughs> All right, so I'll uh, wrap this up. And I, so I agree with a lot of the comments made by other panelists. If we look out 10 years, uh, the most obvious thing is transactions costs for financial transactions are going to come way down. So uh, cross-border payments uh, are very expensive right now. There's no reason for that. And I, I think over time, a variety of financial transactions that are currently expensive will be much, much cheaper to do. Uh, the speed will be way up as Caitlin has highlighted. Uh, there are a lot of uh, areas where transactions take a long time and that's going to be a thing of the past. We're going to see speed is way up and, and that's true in the crypto space, but it's also true in kind of the regulated payment space. Uh, you're going to see much more global integration. And as Caitlin also highlighted, uh, the dollar is basically the currency of the internet. I expect that to likely continue. Certainly, if we get the, the infrastructure right, I think that will be true. And finally, on the upside, I think uh, 10 years from now, we will have a Fed now that provides that real-time payment system that is very fast and works through uh, basically uh, a banking infrastructure, but we'll probably also have a digital currency that um, <clears throat> also provides a very stable base for doing payments for those that are non-banked or wanna work outside of the banking system. But those are all the positive returns. I wanna highlight also the risks. And so um, you don't have to talk to too many people who've invested in crypto before you find somebody who lost all the money out of their wallet, not because the value went down, but because somebody stole it. So there are still concerns about using it. Uh, so we have to worry about security. We have to worry about privacy. We have to worry about money laundering. I would say that many of the platforms are more focused on uh, making sure they're innovative and fast and low cost and spending less time on resilience security and privacy. And we probably need to get a better balance on that. And if, if, if you look at the pre-check period that was highlighted in that earlier Richmond Fed study, uh, one of the attributes was there were a lot of financial crises as people weren't able to, you know, as people thought they had something that was money good and it turned out not to be money good. I think there's a risk that uh, a completely unregulated crypto stablecoin sector um, will be the source of the next financial stability crisis. And so in the next 10 years, if we don't get this right, I think that there are significant downside risks to the next time we have something uh, akin to a financial crisis like we did in 2008, it will be coming from this unregulated sector. So I think we need to think carefully about how we have a, a base that is safe and then think about how do we maintain the innovation um, and all that's going on right now in the crypto space without putting the entire global economy at risk at the same time. And I think that balance is gonna be fairly delicate. And I think the people in the regulatory space who understand this very well are fairly limited. And I think people in the crypto space uh, tend not to worry about tail events, but as we've seen both in the pandemic and the financial crisis, tail events are extremely costly. And uh, the fact that we've had so much trouble regulating prime money market funds in a way that avoids a tail event just highlights that it's not gonna be that straightforward in an unregulated sector either that is likely to resist uh, a lot of the regulatory infrastructure. So I, I think they're huge returns, but I also think between now and 10 years from now, there are also very significant risks. 
Let, let me turn the floor over to Asani to uh, continue to moderate our discussion. Asani? Of course, right on the point, Bill, when we talk about tail events, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, more volatility, as Eric said. Um, I wanted to, if I may, um, turn to Tomaika and um, and you referred uh, Tomaika to uh, the role of regulators and your policy paper coming up. What do you think, and, and I'd love to ask uh, all, the, um, all the speakers today, um, what should be the role of uh, regulation and supervision in this area? And what is too much regulation uh, that will be stifling and not let you innovate? And what is too little innovation? You know, Huyen Song did mention all the problems that we can have on the other side. Could you elaborate on that, starting with Tomaika? Absolutely. So it's a wonderful question, Afsana, and uh, thank you for it. Um, a few thoughts on this. Uh, the first is, we have a challenge right now in that we are trying in many instances to cram very new technologies into very old regulatory frameworks. Uh, most of the securities uh, law that we have in the United States dates back many, many, many decades. Uh, and we're trying to take instruments that uh, really are not a good fit for those frameworks uh, and, and shoehorn them into uh, entities that really aren't designed for this type of regulatory activity. Uh, so that's point number one. Uh, point number two is that we need to be, I think, very thoughtful about what our objectives are. Uh, in too many instances, we are trying to, uh, again, uh, reverse engineer uh, the innovation to meet a regulatory framework rather than going back and asking the first principles questions around what we want to accomplish, whether that's greater equity, greater inclusion, greater efficiency. There are a whole array of uh, objectives that are very legitimate policy objectives, and those seem to be getting lost in, in a lot of the work that's being done uh, right now by regulators. Um, in terms of what this looks like at a concrete level, we firmly believe that we need a regulatory framework. And, and there is a perception among some that somehow industry does not want regulation. Uh, we have been asking for regulation. I, I dare say we have almost been begging for regulation uh, for a very long time. Uh, and so we, we really are eager to work with policymakers uh, to get this right. We think ultimately that will involve some degree of harmonization across the dozen agencies uh, that are currently in, uh, engaged in these efforts. It will probably involve a focus on addressing the specific risks that are associated with specific applications of this technology rather than a one size fits all approach. Uh, so there is a, a perception among some that these technologies are a monolith. That's absolutely not the case. They encompass everything from art creation and curation uh, and collectibles on, on one side of the equation that are clearly not systemically important and, and really, frankly, probably shouldn't be regulated uh, in, in any meaningful sense, to on the other side of the uh, equation, something like stable coins, which are potentially very systemically consequential and, and do have, as Eric indicated, some significant risks associated with them uh, and, and do require a, a more rigorous uh, regulatory uh, oversight approach uh, going forward. Um, so we, we think that you need to match the risks with the regulatory framework, and, and that's not really something uh, that is happening uh, right now in the way that it should. Uh, the last point I will make on this is there is a, a wonderful opportunity, uh, if we get this right, uh, to look beyond the finance system, and I alluded to this earlier. We're seeing the integration of digital technologies and financial technologies, or the potential to integrate digital technologies and financial technologies uh, in a way that could be wildly beneficial for society going forward. Um, that is only going to happen if we take a comprehensive approach and look at these tools as a whole, uh, rather than the very narrow siloed efforts that are underway uh, in some parts of the government right now. Um, so I, I think we need to view this again as how we want to build the third generation of the internet, rather than how we're going to tackle a very narrow challenge related to stable coins or digital currencies. I'll pause there. Thank you very much. And I'm sure as you were talking earlier about, and everybody else was talking about having um, a sort of an ID for everyone that has so many other implications than just payment systems and 
Um, so going on to uh, you, uh, Yon Song, you also did uh, touch on regulation and the problems on the other side. Would love to hear from you on this question of regulation. Yeah, thanks, Afsana. Um, I think um, you know the traditional approach to regulation is either from the perspective of ensuring financial stability, or uh, you know conduct, um, you know regulation of conduct, uh, you know with a view to you know protecting consumers, uh, ensuring compliance with the rules, and so on. Um, and I think there, um, you know, this uh, this activities-based approach, you know, may need to be supplemented actually when we look at uh, some of the new structures that that could emerge. And you you may have seen that. Um, you know, we published a, a BIS bulletin on this issue uh, during the summer um, uh, of how you know one might approach the the regulation of uh, of this sector when there is you know so much you know scope for concentration and and network effects and the speed with which uh, you know some of these uh, you know activities can can really become concentrated. And I think here uh, you know we do dovetail with the with the debate on big tech regulation. Um, where the issues go beyond financial stability and conduct and, uh, uh, and consumer protection to, uh, to touch on issues such as competition um, and also data privacy. So, you know, data privacy regulation tends to be somewhat, uh, um, you know, we, we tend to think of it as being a somewhat separate problem. We bring to bear, uh, you know, somewhat different arguments. We, um, you know, we tend to think of it as a kind of basic right that needs to be uh, that needs to be protected, um, you know, uh, over and above any kind of instrumental role. So this this triple, um, if you like, um, role of regulation. First of all, uh, you know, financial stability and conduct uh, on the one hand, coupled with competition, as well as data privacy, mean that uh, I think the policy challenges are actually even um, even larger than than Afsana you actually laid out and. Um, given the speed with which this sector actually, uh, you know, has evolved, um, I think the it's in, it's incumbent on us as the policy community more broadly uh, to be really um, be fully aware of uh, you know some of the deeper issues here, and uh, you know reach out to others in the official sector as well as the private sector, and um, uh, and to to other interest groups to actually have uh, you know a kind of joined up approach. And um, what this means, I think, in part, is that uh, you know we may need to go beyond an activities-based approach, where same activity, same regulation. That motto needs to be modified uh, whenever you have the scope for you know very large um, entities uh, to to have a much um, you know bigger impact than simply their you know the sum of their activities. And uh, to some extent, what the what the European Union has done through the Digital Markets Act. Uh, the Digital Services Act, where they have a kind of th a size threshold um, to um, to really inform their rules. I think uh, means that uh, increasingly we're going to be looking at more of an entities-based approach uh, that's overlaid on top of the activities-based approach. And um, uh, so I think here, um, you know, we can certainly um, uh, you know take a leaf out of uh, some of the things that we possibly you know didn't do as well in the past. Um, I think certainly the um, the fragmentation of the uh, you know of the regulatory system so it, you know will not help here. Um, but I think you know this is something that uh, um, I think one thing is for sure. This is something that will not wait for uh, the regulators to to get their act together, and uh, we we re really need to approach this with a, you know with a sense of urgency. Really appreciate that. Uh, going to Eric, I'm just curious, Eric, given where you sit um, in your chair in Boston, both in terms of uh, you know being president um, of FEB, but also uh, the research you're doing with MIT and other work you're doing on the policy front leading. Um, as you hear from our other two panelists and you think about the subject, how soon is this regulation? I mean, if, uh, your comments on the broader regulatory question, but also how soon do you think we might have the kind of regulation that meets the technology that we have today? So just to highlight, I'm the, the former president of the Boston Fed, so I'm retired at this Sorry, point. Sorry, I meant former. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I agree that it would be nice to have a fully integrated regulatory structure. Um, 
I would say that I am not optimistic that in 10 years we will have a fully integrated financial regulatory structure in the United States at least. And the time that that kind of regula regulatory structure normally occurs is after a financial crisis. So many parts of the world got a much more integrated financial regulatory structure coming out of the financial crisis. The United States did not. We still have a highly fragmented system. Uh, different regulators play different roles. So uh, the first thing I think to highlight is if you're trying to reconstruct the financial regulatory system, that's a marathon, that's not a sprint, that's not gonna solve near term problems. The second thing I would highlight is Hun's comments on privacy, security, and resilience, I think are all important. I think they've not gotten much focus in the United States. They've gotten much more focus in other parts of the world. That's something that probably needs a lot more attention. The problem is just like the payment system, uh, the United States doesn't have an integrated regulatory structure to deal with those issues. So it's quite unclear which regulator or regulators would be responsible for uh, that activity. So there does need to be some thinking about how that's done. I guess the regulation that I'm primarily worried about at this point, and again, the United States is an outlier, is in the financial stability space. So most parts of the world, there is an integrated financial stability regulator, either at the central bank or the finance ministry. In the United States, there actually is nobody responsible for financial stability. Uh, I mean, in some sense, the SEC and the Fed and other entities all think about it, but uh, we don't have the regulatory mandate and the tools in the United States that, for example, the Bank of England got when they did their overhaul of uh, regulation. So while a piecemeal regulation is not optimal, um, I would say the thing that worries the, me the most is the lack of regulation of stable coins. The easiest way to get stable coins under a regulatory umbrella would be to designate it a systemically important activity that would come under the Federal Reserve's regulation. And the Federal Reserve would then come up with a set of rules and regulations that uh, would provide a regulatory structure for stable coins. So while I don't disagree with the other speakers that in uh, a perfect world, we'd have an integrated financial structure, um, I'm also a very practical guy. And as a result, I'd really focus on the things that I think are most likely to result in tail events in the near term. Um, and that would probably be, I would start with stable coins. Thank you so much. I think that's really, really interesting. And on to you, Caitlin, for your thoughts, because you also live it every day in your day job. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I would say the, the regulation is very simple. It needs to focus on the fiat on and off ramps. In other words, the banking system and how that integrates in with the digital asset industry. There are only a few banks in the United States that service this industry due to the risks associated with it. And again, I would, I would caution that uh, Basel III capital requirements do not take into account the, that settlement risk. The settlement risk is a very big one. In general, by the way, this, this is not specific to crypto. As we speed up payments, the, there's a lot of fault tolerance that is built into the system. There are, because of central clearing of most assets that are traded in the financial system, you have tolerance for failures to deliver on collateral. You have fault tolerance for the systems not being in perfect sync with each other at any given moment, because it's just not possible for them all to be in perfect sync with each other at any given moment. And the challenge with speeding up settlement generally, including with the coming of Fed now, is that all that fault tolerance that got built into the system through these delayed net settlement mechanisms starts to go away. And we're going to have a lot more risk and the banks are going to have to raise more capital and, and do a massive technology upgrade just to handle APIs and just to handle Fed now, not even dealing with uh, much less um, cryptocurrencies. But with that said, that settlement risk, again, um, the US system is not set up for that. There are only, as I said, a handful of banking core providers that are even API native and, uh, and only a handful of, of banks that went ahead and built the middleware to integrate themselves, uh, to build APIs, API front ends, 
uh, like I said, uh, turn the, create a Ferrari front end engine for that horse and buggy back end. Uh, but all of that is going to be upgraded, no question, in, 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 the next, uh, in the next few years. And so that's where the regulation needs, needs to be focused, is the banking system endpoints. That's the on and off ramps. That's how US dollars enter into this system. I'll close by saying that one of the challenges with waiting as long as the US has waited is that the euro dollar market, which you know is offshore and not really directly within the reach of the Fed, um, except through the, the regulation of correspondent banking, um, uh, uh, the, the, the tether is mostly a euro dollar phenomenon. There's not much connectivity to the actual US dollar banking system. And I think uh, Matt Levine's Bloomberg article last week really shed light, including for me, on what is that 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 reserve asset allocation, what 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 is it really invested in? And the truth is, it's invested in a lot of U.S. dollar instruments that don't directly touch the U.S. banking system, and that's going to create a big challenge. I've always warned the 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 crypto industry that anything that touches the U.S. dollar is ultimately the purview of the Federal Reserve, and the Fed, if it chooses to, can much more aggressively. Uh, regulate correspondent banking on and off ramps. But now we're back to this very big challenge uh, that the Fed has faced for decades, going back to the late 1960s, which is the euro dollar. There are offshore banks creating US dollar and, and offshore financial institutions that are not directly regulated by the Fed that create US dollar balances. And so you will, I think, continue to see um, stable coins circulating in offshore markets that are not regulated, where there is a lot more leverage uh, but as long as it's not directly connected back to the U.S. system and never comes back to the U.S. system, uh, it, it poses less of a stability risk than those that are directly connected to, to the U.S. system. And this euro dollar challenge has, has been there from a regulatory perspective, as, as we all know, for decades. This is just the latest manifestation of it. Thank you for that, Caitlin. Um, really interesting also your points about the Eurobond, which is a whole other subject that I know uh, Bill and others uh, at Bretton Woods have spent a lot of time on. Back to you, Bill. I think we have a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions from the audience, so I think we should go, go there. I'm going to turn the floor over to Emily Slater and she can see up a few of the questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of interest. Um, I think some of them have been addressed, especially in uh, the risk of prime money market funds, anti uh, money laundering, and the, and the fraudulent activity risks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mahesh Koteka, and he had a follow up question specifically for Tamika. So Mahesh, do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much, uh, Emily. A pleasure to listen to the. Uh distinguished panelists, and I'm struck that two of them, actually the speakers have white hair in a discussion that is completely technologically dominated. I'm reminded of a conference I went to in Monaco in 2006, at which CPDOs were being discussed, the CDO kind of con synthetic CPDOs. And I was struck with the discussion that was infested with um, acronyms and complex terminology, and I think we kind of have that here today. Uh, so my concern is about risk and the risk that was underlined by uh, Mr. Tilleman regarding the very simple things, huge losses and fraud. Um, the potential for which it seems to me is accelerated when you have speeding currency, uh, speeding transaction settlements, as Caitlin Long has mentioned, and when you don't have any capital requirements at all under Basel III. So my question is, if you don't have regulatory uh, 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 policy agreements in the US, let alone the rest of the world, where is this risk going to end up and who's going to pay? And how do we recover? Well, thank you. It's an excellent question. And you know what I would say is, first, the, the risk that I described all took place in the existing financial system, those hundreds of billions of dollars of losses that we see each year, uh, and, and that's taxpayer money uh, in the United States, are all occurring in the context of the existing financial system. Uh, the estimates that I've seen are that roughly 99% of money laundering activity in the current financial system goes undetected. So we have some big challenges, uh, again, with the status quo. 
the good news is that many of these technologies, blockchain-based technologies, provide a much higher degree of traceability and accountability when it comes to the movement of digital assets. Uh, you, know, you contrast this with cash, no regulator in their right mind would approve cash today uh, if it were proposed to them as a solution, uh, because it's extremely problematic. Uh, and uh, digital currencies and, and blockchain-based currencies in particular uh, provide much greater levels of visibility. Uh, Hewn pointed out the, the concerns that arise around privacy, and there are some very important issues that need to be addressed there. But we see, uh, ideally, a, a future in the not too uh, you know, distant horizon where there will be high levels of privacy protection using a combination uh, of blockchain, federated learning, homomorphic encryption, uh, and uh, related tools, uh, and also the ability to identify where resources are moving uh, in the event that they are being used for illicit purposes. We've seen this already in the case of the colonial pipeline hack that occurred earlier this year. Uh, law enforcement was able to identify and actually recover assets that had been paid uh, as a ransom uh, because of the visibility that's provided uh, by blockchain-based systems. Uh, ideally, we get to a point uh, where uh, law enforcement will have a, a high degree of confidence in their ability to go after bad actors, but normal citizens can have a high degree of confidence that their transactions are secure and private uh, and uh, are going to be completed as intended. Any of the other panelists like to tack on or should we go to the next audience question? I'm gonna go next to uh, Takatoshi Ito then. Um, Taka, are you there? Would you like to go ahead and pose your question? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, this is a question about uh, CBDC and uh, China seems to be a front runner in preparation for issuing CBDC and they conducted uh, several experiments already. And uh, when uh, uh, introduced, uh, it may become a payment settlement vehicle for exports, imports, and investment, and uh, repayment uh, uh, between China and other, I would say, China-friendly nations. And um, uh, not to mention the domestic uh, uh, transactions. And if that happens, the U.S. dollar dominance, which panelists uh, emphasized uh, in the last hour uh, in the digital world may be challenged. So what are the panelists' views? Uh, maybe Eric and Hyun uh, uh, to start uh, on the future of uh, ECNY and impacts on the dollar dominance in international finance. Thank you. Eric, do you want to go ahead or shall I start? Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. Uh, so good to hear your voice, Taka. I didn't see your uh, picture, but uh, nice to know that you're on. Um, so I think there are challenges for people to use uh, uh, potential Chinese CBDC. And one of those challenges is you don't know how that data is going to be used over time. And so I think that one of the challenges for it to be more widely used is that there are continuing to be concerns that uh, the information that you would provide through a Chinese CBDC uh, may not meet the, the privacy and other concerns that other systems might. So as long as that's true, uh, I have a feeling that we'll probably still be more dollar-based than we will be on a, a Chinese currency base. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the currency of choice already for the stable coins is dollar denominated. So that already is occurring. And a lot of trade currently occurs in dollars as well. So uh, given the constellation of where the transactions are currently done and the potential concern about how data might be used, um, I think in the near term, I'm not that concerned about the dollar dominance. If we're not successful in getting uh, Fed now and eventually a digital currency launched in the United States, it could become a longer term uh, issue. 
uh, but I don't think it's as big a short-term issue as some others might. Yeah, uh, Emily, I think my my views, uh, I think dovetail very very closely with what what uh, Eric has just um, just outlined. So Taka, I think the um, there is a big difference between um, you know cash uh, circulating uh, anonymously and the digital currency that's based on a centralized ledger. Uh, with a centralized ledger, and the and the ECNY uh, is a centralized ledger. It, it, it works by you know debiting the account of the of the payer, uh, crediting the account of the receiver. Um, it's um, uh, it's not like cash that's circulating in briefcases. So um, there has to be an updating of the ledger as you you know as you make those payments in the system. And so the extent to which um, there will be uh, the use of the digital currency outside the jurisdiction really depends on what scope there is to accommodate you know that kind of transaction on the ledger itself. And um, uh, at the moment, the uh, the ECNY is is designed very much as a domestic payment system, um, and uh, to be a member of the of the network, uh, uh, um, you you very much have to be you know part of the uh, uh, the existing payment system. So I think the the analogy with uh, briefcases of uh, of cash circulating in the black market is just not a very good analogy for uh, for digital currency. In that respect. Now, having said all that, of course, um, once the transactions then um, dovetail with the with the underlying, um, you know, uh, uh, with the underlying, uh, you know, payment flows, uh, you know, that could change over a very long period. But as as Eric said, um, I think this is not something that's going to change overnight. So the, just just a mere fact that there is a digital currency probably will not affect the underlying economics because. There are so many of the pieces that are mutually reinforcing. If you think about how the uh, the payment chain actually works, um, just currency being digital is not going to affect the underlying economics. Uh, remember that you know you have uh, um, you know if you, if you think about the, the way that uh, bills of exchange used to work in the 18th century, there has to be a link, uh, some underlying economic transaction, and if everyone else uses a particular currency then of course your uh, interest is also to follow suit and use that currency as well. So there is actually a very strong uh, you know, reinforcement effect uh, there as well. Now, having said all that, once in a while you do get uh, you know, very big changes with uh, you know, very large shifts in the financial system itself. It's just as sterling was knocked uh, off its perch by the, by the dollar, but those, are, you know, uh, but those big events are occasioned by very major you know, upheavals. And uh, so I think for the moment, um, we can probably overestimate the extent to which uh, we use the analogy of, um, you know, cash circulating in briefcases. That's not a very good analogy. Thanks to you both. Um, I, I think we have time for one final question and I'm just gonna ask a summary question here. Um, we've had a few questions on Bitcoin in particular uh, and the specific use case for Bitcoin and maybe what we're learning from El, Sal El Salvador in terms of the use case for Bitcoin. Uh, so maybe Caitlin, do you wanna take that one to start and uh, just hear the panelists final thoughts on um, El Salvador adopting Bitcoin? Sure. Uh, what's most interesting to me about El Salvador adopting Bitcoin is that it's now legal tender in a country and most commercial laws, accounting rules and tax regulations recognize legal tender as a foreign currency and treat it differently than Bitcoin itself is treated. So what you're now seeing is a scramble for the Bitcoin industry to get a nexus to El Salvador so that it can be treated as a foreign currency. What does that mean? In the US specifically, money is defined on a commercial law to include a foreign government's medium of exchange. Well, that's Bitcoin now in El Salvador. Um, and, and, this, and instead of having the asymmetric accounting under US GAAP and IFRS, where it's, it's the lower of cost or market, you're, mar you're, you're marking down for impairments, but not marking up until you sell Bitcoin. If it's a foreign currency, then it can be marked to market up and down. 
Um, and then the, the tax is obviously unique to each specific jurisdiction. But again, foreign currency gains tend to be treated differently than Bitcoin gains itself. And so that is interesting um, it, because it's pushing the G20 countries into something we've never seen before, which is a global digital currency being now treated as money under these old existing rules. And that's going to have to be addressed. Is that indeed the answer that the, that the different legal accounting and tax systems are anticipating, or will they change the rules uh, accordingly? Um, but, but I must close by pointing to the specifics of the Lightning Network. A lot of folks look at Bitcoin and say it's slow because transactions are only a, a new block is only appended on average every 10 minutes. But that's not true with the Lightning Network. There is much, much significant increase in, in throughput and speed of transactions for small value payments. And so what's happening in Bitcoin is we're seeing a scaling of exactly the way most monetary systems scale. You have the high value transfers in the commercial, in the central bank money, which only the banks have access to. And those are high value transfer payment systems. Um, and then, then the commercial banks are the ones that create the retail value payment transfers. And that's indeed what's happening with Bitcoin. Every, every monetary network in history has scaled through creating layers, creating IOUs that are, that are hopefully knock on wood, uh, um, anchored to the base layer. Uh, and I say knock on wood because that has increasingly not been true in fiat systems. But the Lightning Network is anchored to the Bitcoin network. So you still know there won't be more than 21 million Bitcoins. Uh, and, and that's how Lightning is scaling. And I must say, we're seeing with El Salvador a large scale technology test of that Lightning Network. And it has definitely had challenges, but it has not been a flop, that's for sure. Uh, and it was interesting to see uh, folks are posting their their McDonald's receipts with the QR code. Anyone can go on and scan the QR codes and check those to see that was a lightning network payment. And someone actually used the Bitcoin blockchain through its second layer lightning network payment system to purchase a, a, a small, small dollar value lunch at McDonald's. And uh, this is happening instantly with virtually no cost. That's a pretty powerful technology, and it's a, it's a very interesting scaling technology that everyone should be studying. Thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. And we're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask our panelists any, any final thoughts. Uh, maybe, Eric, we'll start with you on, uh, in response to Caitlin on Bitcoin in El Salvador, and we'll go through, and then I want to give Afsane a chance to wrap it up. Okay, I'll try to be quick. El Salvador is a small country with relatively low financial uh, volume. So I don't know whether I would extrapolate very far from an El Salvador experience. Um, I think stable coins much more interesting for transactions medium than something like Bitcoin where the asset uh, volatility makes it not a particularly attractive way to buy your cup of coffee or your McDonald's lunch. So uh, I, I think it's an, an interesting anomaly, but I wouldn't draw much conclusion. I think Bitcoin actually is less a payments mechanism and more an asset class that's less correlated with other financial assets. And I think for many people, that's going to be its main attraction. Thanks, Eric. Hoon, want to go to you and then to Micah, wrap up, and then to Afsane. I think Eric really uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, I think we, you know, we, um, um, I think we, we should not, uh, I think, underestimate, uh, you know, some of the difficulties that, uh, you know, when you're trying to, uh, you know, build uh, something as, um, you know, something as, uh, you know, all encompassing as a payment system um, through uh, technology, uh, you know, such as such as Bitcoin. I think that's, you know, there'll be many challenges. And I think, uh, you know, Eric really, really hit the nail on the head. Um, I think the, um, the bigger issue is to do with, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, AML and KYC. How do we make that uh, system, you know, um, uh, you know, consistent with um, with our, you know, other uh, rules on on conduct? 
And I think on my end, yeah, we see uh, Bitcoin largely as an analog for gold, and it is a, in many ways a much more effective uh, analog for gold. There are a wide array of other uh, digital currencies and blockchain-based payment mechanisms uh, that have come online in recent years. All of them have different characteristics. Uh, it is unlikely that there will be uh, thousands and thousands of these going forward. There will uh, likely be some consolidation, uh, but it is important to, uh, at least at a policy level, have an understanding of some of the trade-offs uh, that are present as you look at different systems uh, around issues like uh, throughput uh, and around issues like uh, KYC. Uh, on that last point, uh, the, the thing I would uh, perhaps conclude with uh, is that it's going to be critical for policymakers that are looking at CBDCs uh, and other solutions like Bitcoin to ensure that they don't out China China uh, as they try to deploy solutions. Uh, it's going to be critical to ensure that we're not creating uh, data architecture that will give rise to uh, widespread surveillance in a way that uh, many of us would find very troubling. Uh, and of course, uh, that we do have safeguards in place uh, for law enforcement. We should be able to do this. These are solvable problems. The technology now exists, uh, again, as uh, was stated earlier, policy and politics will be the, the trickiest part of getting this right, uh, but that's why this conversation is so valuable. Thank you, Tamika, and thank you all for joining us. Efsane, I'm gonna turn it to you to, to wrap us up here. Thank you so much, Emily, and uh, to your colleagues at the Bretton Woods Committee for organizing this really important discussion. It's an honor to be part of the organization as for four decades, uh, the committee has been a key driver fostering economic cooperation and strengthening financial stability. And of course, the challenges were balance of payments, financial surveillance, financial development, and today, uh, digital currencies are the great challenge and the great opportunity as we've heard from our panelists. And um, cryptocurrency, CBDC and blockchain technology have great promise to accelerate transaction across the globe and uh, to democratize access. And we heard about the importance of equity and access a number of times in the conversation and um, and who particularly did emphasize the issues related to data privacy at the same time which is an enormous challenge. Um, Tomika pointed out there are 100 data breaches every day and we do not have the comprehensive digital infrastructure that we need for fast, secure digital transactions. And what Eric said really stayed with me, which is in the next 10 years, if we don't get this right, it will be the cause of the next great financial crisis. Eric, it reminded me, you know, when we look at the railways and the roads, you know, because we had infrastructure early, we had a problem later. Our infrastructure is out of date. Because we had a great banking system and payment system, and you know it all worked well, we have maybe not been as fast as we need to be to uh, really jump ahead with the new innovations that we need. And we need these smart policies. We need digital infrastructure that works across borders. And a number of you did point out the fact that the costs and the speed between current systems and what uh, digital currencies could provide is huge. And you know whether we looked at the example of Kenya, a positive, um, or Bangladesh, positive, or China, or other places, I think Brazil, you know, a number of really excellent positive cases of how digital currency, but also broad, more broadly, crypto and and um, and uh, new currencies have been able to move us much faster and give access to marginalized populations, low income populations who have not access to payment systems. Um, I think maybe um, Emily, just the one or two other points that people said is the importance of having harmonized regulation and regulation that fits the technology that we have and make sure that there are not lots and lots of different regulators at the same time, no clear regulatory framework that governs digital currencies is really key to the conversation and our topic. That, you know, we have seen a lot of research from the BIS, from the Atlantic Council, from many of you on this panel uh, that shows that we need a fully integrated financial structure. And as Eric said, only um, the only times we see changes in those structures is after the financial crisis. Um, so. This is a marathon, not a sprint, right? And uh, it will be an ongoing issue over the next decades and decades to come. 
and the Bretton Woods Committee will continue playing a large role in convening these important discussions to help guide our policies uh, so that crypto and digital currencies can help maintain a stable financial systems in the years and decades to come. Back to you, Emily. Thank you, Asane, and thanks again to all of our panelists. That was an excellent summary and also an excellent discussion. We are over time, so we are going to leave it there. Thank you all for being very generous with your time. Thank you to our audience. Uh, it's a busy week. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.